All right. Good morning. If I remember the date, this is the uh, April 14th meeting of the Curriculum Instruction Committee, and uh, I'll call it to order. Um, let's see. Do we have any public comment, Dr. Cuppet? Uh, we haven't yet. Linda, can you confirm we've received none in the last few minutes? We have not received any. Thank you. Um, and as it's well, no, as it's just Mr. Uh, Jay and myself, uh, did you have any corrections to the to the minutes, Mr. Jay? Oh, no, I did not. Okay, I didn't either. So those will stand um, as written. Any comments you want to make? Probably not at this point, right, Mr. Jay? That is correct. Okay, and there's Ms. Johnson. Very good. Ms. Johnson, any, any comments you want to make before we get into our presentations? Okay, all right, then let's... Get started, Dr. Cuppet. The floor is yours. Absolutely. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, we're excited to have uh, three different presentations today. The first one that we're going to start with is about our visual and performing arts program, which is truly a gem in what we do here in Frederick County Public Schools. Um, Kim Hirschman, who's our secondary visual performing arts curriculum specialist, and Susan Thomas, who serves in that same role at the elementary level, will be giving updates. Uh, for our newer members of the committee, these are just a, one of those in a series of periodic updates that we give about the, the ongoing curriculum work, uh, programming that occurs in the district. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank them for being the champions of the visual performing arts that they are. And I know that they work hard every day for our teachers and our students and are big advocates for the the what the benefits the arts bring to our students. And as a former arts teacher myself, I can get right behind that. So I'm going to turn it over to Kim and to Susan, and Kim's going to kick us off, and I will be controlling the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, good morning. I'm Kim Hirschman. Thank you so much to the committee for your time today, and thank you to Dr. Cuppet for running our slides as we go through the presentation. It's always a pleasure to be able to update the board on the things that we have going on in our fine and visual performing arts programs. And I'll wait for the first slide to come up. So Dr. Cuppet, go ahead to slide number two, please, for our Academy for the Fine Arts updates. There we go. So a couple weeks ago, I presented the approval for the pilot for a musical theater strand for the Academy for the Fine Arts. And this is delayed a year. We plan to pilot this in 2022, 2023, because there are some things that need to be worked out prior to starting the program. For example, ensuring that we have the appropriate staffing for the program and for the TJ general population arts classes. We have to recruit for that program, communicate with students who are interested in applying, and they have to go through the audition process. So we would plan to begin that pilot in 2022. Additionally, the Academy for the Fine Arts has added uh, two new dual enrollment classes for next school year. So they've added an intro to theater dual enrollment for the students in the theater strand and a second art history dual enrollment for the art strand. So that brings us to a total of seven dual enrollment courses for the Academy for the Fine Arts programs. Next slide. Um, to continue with our Academy for the Fine Arts updates, we do have an increase in enrollment for next year. Um, it's up 35%. And actually, since the printing of this slide, it's up a little bit more. We have 102 students for school year 21-22, and this is the largest total enrollment in our AFA history. Additionally, we are looking forward to a um, new dance studio that will be put into TJ High School pending funding, but I, I do believe we're in a position where there are very serious discussions and planning right now for this space, which can also be used as a multi-purpose space for a variety of arts shows. Could be shows, could be theater performances. Uh, we'll be sure that it's a multi-use room for a variety of projects. Next slide. For secondary dance, we have some great things in the dance world. We're trying to expand the visibility of our dance programs and the, the offerings that we have for students in dance. So next year, we plan to offer a new countywide dance solo and ensemble adjudicated event for students in the spring of 2022. This is a new event that we have never done in FCPS, so we're looking forward to getting this started for our students who are enrolled in beginning through advanced dance. 
We also have an increase in our dance offerings at the high school level. So we have Frederick High School who just added dance this past year. So we're, you know, we see that there's an increase in student enrollment for this activity. And fortunately, schools are able to support the staffing to create these new dance classes. Um, additionally, our focus is increasing what we have to offer in our unified and inclusive dance programs. So for example, we have a couple of dance teachers who have been collaborating with Anne Arundel County and focused on writing some curriculum for our unified dance course, as well as just increasing um, what we have in our toolbox to be able to serve those students who are in our inclusive classes in dance. Next slide. For secondary music, our summer curriculum focus is a, an evaluation of our, basically our scope and sequence that we have for our music performing ensembles of band, choir, and orchestra. In 2019, we collaborated with our colleagues in fourth and fifth grade instrumental and vocal music to create uh, a sequence chart that connects all of our skill sets. And we just would like an opportunity to revisit that, ensure that we feel it's an appropriate sequence and start to work on resources that support that instruction. Additionally, we also look forward to increased teacher collaboration to strengthen our recruitment and retention as a result of pandemic related challenges. Um, should be no surprise that the pandemic has certainly hurt the performing arts in some ways. Um, I'm always impressed with what our teachers have been able to do to recover and we just need to move forward with that recovery and what that looks like for FCPS. Next slide. In secondary theater, our summer curriculum focus is on refining the scope and term terminology of our advanced theater courses. So a couple years ago, we took some of the theater classes that were offered and renamed them so that the course sequence is theater one through six and technical theater one through six. So now we just need to revisit and ensure that we have the appropriate resources for the different levels of, of both of those strands, theater and technical theater. Same as the previous slide for theater, we're looking forward to um, just a stronger collaboration with recruitment in the feeder patterns to recover from some of our pandemic related challenges. Next slide visual art. So we have an exciting um, curriculum refresh in middle school. Uh, we're going to take the creative arts course and start to move it in a direction that incorporates more digital and media arts, which is helping us move towards Comar um, certification for adding media arts in the middle school level with a focus on cultural relevance. So the quote that I like to use is looking at our students as creators of culture versus just consumers of culture. So I'm looking forward to, to revamping that curriculum. Um, additionally, for the other areas outside of creative arts and visual arts, we're going to continue to focus our efforts on creating strong resources for Black African American History Month and Women's History Month for our teachers. Next slide is uh, turning it over to Susan Thomas. Thanks, Kim. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to see you and I appreciate your time this morning. I'm in the uh, fortunate position in that I can echo a lot of the sentiments that Kim had said as, um, as far as our focus and our drive in the curriculum for visual and performing arts for next year. As many of her priorities are the same in elementary as far as the challenges that we're facing with recruitment and retention, particularly in our um, elementary and instrumental program who have been completely virtual since March of 2020. So they're facing unique challenges of teaching beginning band students without ever being able to you know, physically be in their presence. So we, we have those same kind of challenges as well. But um, we're continuing our work from last summer as far as um, revising our pacing guides, especially after going through um, different instructional variances throughout the pandemic and identifying priority standards for this upcoming year. Being able to identify um, the real basic core not necessarily our essential curriculum, but taking that essential curriculum and paring it down even more to find the absolute definite skills and mastery levels that students need to have um, after miss, I don't wanna say missing, but after having perhaps an altered arts experience throughout the pandemic. Next slide. So in elementary VPA, um, we're currently and over the summer, we'll continue reformatting our pacing guides temporarily to address um, some unfinished learning. One of the challenges that we face in elementary um, music and art as principals were devising the schools that are devising the schedules that work best for their schools, we found that there were some instructional variances as far as seat time 
with students, whether they are, you know, whether they're face to face now or, or have been virtual. And um, it is my intention that teachers will be encouraged to participate in a needs assessment survey of what they've gotten through as far as the pacing guide goes, because that helps us drive forward what those priority standards need to be for next year. Um, there's a big difference if, a, you know, if a student has say 15 minutes of art a week versus 80 minutes of art a week. So we're looking to find sort of what everyone was able to accomplish and what a good starting point would be to address the unfinished learning for next year. Um, we're also looking to continue expanding our work in pre-kindergarten as more of our schools are having full day pre-K classes. We do have a curriculum framework. We do have skills checklists. We do have um, resources and suggested activities. We don't have a formal curriculum yet, but as our pre-K program continues to expand, we're ready to move on with truly aligning that a little better with our first grade, our, our um, spiraling curriculum in first grade and create what would end up being our formal pre-K curriculum in uh, visual art and general music. Another exciting focus that we're going to have, and we have had since um, January, is putting a focus on equity work in the visual arts. And um, we have already submitted Black African American History Month resources, and we've completed women's studies. Those haven't been released yet, but what we wanna do is continue to provide resources and even some ready-made modifiable lesson plans for our teachers to be able to expand the um, cultural experiences of our students. So throughout the summer and throughout next year, we're going to um, give some focus to other cultures and ethnicities where look, we're gonna be looking at um, Indian American heritage, Asian American heritage, Hispanic uh, American heritage. We're gonna go through and try to find um, one for every month, but making sure that we're not giving the impression that women's studies should only be done in March that they can be done all year long, but we'll release them once a month so teachers have fresh banks of resources and lessons that can work across grade levels. We're also going to look at addressing data collection for this year. Traditionally, we do have a set of standard assessments for visual art and um, music from first grade through fifth grade, but because of the uh, instructional time inequities, we can't collect data quite the same way because teachers aren't giving those uh, assessments. So what we're going to do is look back at the concepts rather than the assessments themselves and have teachers um, provide data in more of a, a sliding scale of overall, how well did your students do with the assessments that you did give since you didn't give the, um, the formal common assessments that they're used to giving. So that then also is going to help us identify priority standards and which uh, areas of instruction teachers are going to, to give um, preference to as we move forward for next school year. And then of course, we also are gonna have continued opportunities for professional learning and collaboration. Um, our teachers are involved in PLCs this year, which is new for them. And many of them are very, very happy to have this informal opportunity to speak with me and um, our leadership teams for things, you know, to share ideas, to talk about challenges that they have and to share successes and lesson plans. Um, we also have Schoology groups that are dedicated to content areas where, where teachers can also drop resources and ask questions. Um, we're piloting a Quaver music program with 15 of our schools right now and hopefully that will catch on and schools will be able to continue with that. Um, for next school year, I have Google interest forms out right now that I'm able to, to provide a limited number of subscriptions for the Art of Education and for Music Play Online. And there's been a great interest in that. They're digital resources, they're, they're digital curriculum, but they're not gonna replace our curriculum. It's a supplement to what we already do. Um, we also provide book studies. Actually, Kim and I have been working collaboratively on a book study focused on um, general music that'll be applicable for all teachers from grades, grades K through 12. So hopefully we'll have that up and running where we can have another collaborative opportunity for elementary and secondary teachers to work together and get some professional learning that way. And I believe that is all I have. Yes, thank you. Oh, dear. <laughs> Sorry, of course, the dogs now pick this time to growl at each other and play. Um, uh, Jason or uh, Sue, do you have any questions? I, I don't know. Mm -mm. Thank you for the presentation. Hi, yes. I wanted to um, thank you for the presentation as well. Um, I had uh, a couple. I wanted to just say... Um, 
<clears throat> I wanted to say that um, I, wanted, I wanted to thank you um, for your work in the arts. Um, I think it doesn't get, get said enough that during this time, um, it really is the arts that has helped keep our, our country and our world sane. Um, if you think about it, I, I, I have often, you know, thanked all of the artists who have persevered and shared their work with us on streaming platforms. Because without that, is a, a, a literally, literally a, a, a decorum of mental health that they, they, they've helped maintain. I know at least in my house and uh, people who I've spoken to. So thank you for encouraging students in the arts. Um, and also, not only does this help keep people, um, you know, encouraged and help them um, provide an escape, but also uh, helps become a draw for school. And a lot of times kids are logging in um, to join their art classes, and that's not lost on me. So I want you to know that I fully support um, what I call balanced curricular time. Um, it, 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 I, I think it goes without saying that, um, well, I think it needs to be said that art, CTE, and, and, and courses of the like um, are just as important as uh, our reading and our math courses and, and, and for students, because what happens is it goes beyond, um, it's not just a fun class, it's an expression of gifts, it, it opens up their brain, it allows them um, you know, ways to focus and ways to be creative because um, as a teacher of computer science, creativity is actually quite huge. It, 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 in my um, curriculum. So it's important that students be, be able to think creatively, be able to problem solve. If they can't think creatively, then what happens is you, you, you creativity is part of critical thinking. And so what you do is important. So if no one's told you recently, thank you. Um, I wanted to say that. Um, then I had a question um, about um, NFTs, non fungible tokens. You mentioned uh, about upping uh, our students' um, exposure to the digital art, um, and, and I've seen a lot of press about um, non fungible tokens, about like you know the, the, these digital receipts that you know are like almost like Bitcoin for art that have traded for millions of dollars. Um, are we going to be producing that in, in, in Frederick County? Because I want our kids to be making NFTs. I I personally could not give you a, a firm answer on that. I am. Um, at this time, not the digital art expert until I collaborate with my team. Okay. Well, thank you for, uh, for looking into that. Though. But those are my comments. Thank you very much. And uh, I echo what uh, Mr. J just said. Um, you know, early on in the pandemic, I saw a friend post on Facebook, well, uh, I finished Netflix, you know, and they were kidding, of course, but that he's absolutely right that the arts and, and artists found very unique ways and to wear a digital picture sold for millions of dollars. So it is a whole new world. Um, I did have one question about Quave. Was it Quaver you said, Miss Thomas? Yes, that's right. Could you describe what that is? Sure. It is a digital platform um, that they they do have ready-made lessons done. They do market themselves as a curriculum. So if a school had no series books or had no um, CDs, they didn't have anything to work with that you could teach a generalized music curriculum through Quaver. Now, Frederick County is very specific in our standards and indicators with what we expect our students to do. And all of our schools do have series books and CDs and, and lots of resources with which they can achieve curricular standards. But many of our teachers do like the digital aspect of Quaver because they spend many, many hours creating things that Quaver already has done. So with a subscription to Quaver, um, there is a component where students can submit answers. It's not approved by SCPS and teachers are um, requested not to use it because I don't believe that it matches the PII requirements that we have. But if they are in front of their students, either face-to-face um, -face or virtually, they can absolutely use the um, the songs and the movement activities and their recorder units. It's, it's just a wonderful supplement for teachers who are looking for fresh ideas and um, want to latch into the instant interest that some of our younger learners have that if they're watching something on a screen and it's animated, it could be a real person doing the exact same thing, but sometimes they're gonna watch the animated version and be more tuned into that than watching their teacher. Thank you. And uh, 
there, I have a retired music teacher in my book group and uh, who still plays the flute, goes to Japan. So she's still very much a musician and very uh, hones her craft. But she also keeps in contact with what's going on uh, in Frederick County schools. And so she's always kind of putting things in my ear. And she's pointed out that a lot of times, at least for herself, and she's been retired for a number of years, um, the books were not always up to date. So they may have had books and music doesn't go out of date, but some of the things you talked about making it more culturally aware and things like that might not be part of the books that we had. So it seems good to have uh, a resource that, that would constantly be updated um, without buying a whole new set of books. So it's good to, good to have all those resources. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. And um, just wanted to say that I'm very excited that uh, recruitment or numbers are up for the uh, Fine Arts Academy because that might have been a concern if they couldn't visit as easily. Um, and so that's very good to know. Word is out and we always appreciate uh, what they do. And I'm do I feel like I am seeing dance become quite a thing. Um, we were just at the National School Board Association virtual meeting and um, seeing some of the student uh, performances was wonderful and there were some with dance. So I think that also is getting out there. I don't think I have any other questions for you, but uh, thank you again for all you do. And um, we look forward to, to seeing these things implemented. So thank you. Thank you. So the uh, next item on the agenda is related to our intervention program. And I'll toss this over to Mr. Kyle Barnett to introduce himself and his team. Good morning, Kyle. Good morning, Kevin. Um, so yes, we're delighted to be here. Thank you for having us. Uh, we're excited to talk to you about uh, the world of intervention and all the things that are occurring um, in, in our work. Uh, with me today uh, is Brittany Garst, the teacher specialist for reading intervention. Uh, and Mike, Michael Shesman, the teacher specialist for math intervention to help me uh, in this presentation. We also uh, invited Maggie Hawk, who uh, is a big part of our intervention team as well. Um, so uh, we've, we've, we've come with the full team and we're excited to be here and talk to you. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let me go ahead and present. And Hopefully it comes across to you. It's starting to come up now, Kyle. Yep, that's it. First first uh, title slides right there. Okay, thank you. It was freezing a little bit on my screen. I was hoping we weren't having those issues like we were having this morning. Um, so good. Uh, so in the world of intervention, when we're talking about um, this, the scope of this work, we, we felt it necessary to talk about aspirational goal number one um, and the two priorities listed underneath there. Uh, aspirational goal number one, of course, we're trying to uh, engage and equip every learner. Um, and part of that is making sure they have high quality uh, instruction. And that high quality responsive instruction will not look the same um, for every student. Uh, so that's that's where our intervention pieces come in here. And we hope that if we meet the needs of, of our students and everyone has access to the instruction that's appropriate to them, uh, then we will be able to get to uh, that second priority, which is um, achievement and closing achievement gaps. Hey, Kyle, I just wanted to point out that I am not seeing, seeing the slide change. Can anybody confirm that that you may want to go, now it did, yeah, now it finally did. Okay, um, so thank you. Right now we're seeing aspirational goal one slide. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I also didn't see that switch even though I hit the button, so that was from memory, but I think I uh, captured uh, each point there that we're trying to uh, reach and teach every student um, and make sure they have access to that high quality instruction uh, that's appropriate to them. Uh, and we believe if we uh, do that, then priority two will be taken care of, where we will raise achievement for all students and eliminate those achievement gaps. So we have a multi-tiered system of supports that we uh, focus on when we think about intervening for a student. Uh, of course, instruction 
uh, occurs there in tier one instruction on the core curriculum. Um, and we know that uh, at, at a first uh, teaching, the first time that the student sees instruction, not every child is going to get that skill right off the bat. And so we have to think about wh when we see a student falling below grade level expectations, um, how do we respond to that? Um, and our response is this multi-tiered system of support. It is a fluid process. Uh, we intervene quick uh, as soon as we see students um, performing below grade level expectations. Uh, we try to intervene with the appropriate intensity um, to get students back to those expectations at grade level as efficiently as possible. Um, and so we'll hear more specifics about uh, these tiers uh, as we go through the presentation today. Uh, when we, we look at these multi-tiered system of supports, we have a number of collaborative teams in, in the schools uh, that look at student data um, and look at what the, the level of supports that they can offer and try to get uh, students re to receive the appropriate level of intervention. Um, and so one of those is our core teams. Uh, the core teams, we try to get uh, all the appropriate stakeholders at the table, um, get the right team in place, uh, to make decisions for students and placement and programming. Uh, so you have uh, folks there that are w very well versed on the, the data that the school has. You have people there that are very well versed in the, the program offerings to intervene for the students. You have people at the table that know the student very well. And so when you get all those stakeholders around the table discussing uh, what is best for each and every student, uh, we, we really ap appreciate um, and honor the work of the core teams because that is a really powerful group of, of educators. I know you all have heard about the accelerated learning process um, in the CNI committee, uh, that teacher collaboration where teachers gather together. Uh, we have a common understanding of what the curricular standards are asking uh, students to know and be able to do. Uh, we look at the student learning in front of us to, so that we can collaboratively plan uh, next instructional steps. Uh, and with the goal to uh, help students achieve and also build student agency that student, students are in the driver's seat. They are owning the learning uh, and the process of learning in front of them. And then our student services team um, to review all that data, to, to look at uh, students who uh, may have attendance concerns or discipline concerns or those who may be in danger of failing and to, to look at those multi-tiered system of supports uh, and what can we, we can put in place to uh, support those students uh, to be successful. So back to tier one, uh, tier one, all students receive high quality instruction that is responsive and differentiated. Um, after receiving this highly responsive differentiated instruction, some students may require supplemental instruction on the core curriculum and that's all part of tier one. When we try to intervene uh, here with supplemental instruction, if we still see a need, we still see students not responding to that, um, then we go into tiers two and three. And for the description of what that looks like in reading and math, uh, I will hand that over to Brittany and Mike. And as we have that transition, I just kind of want to say that it is so important to also point out that students always stay in that high quality core program. Yes. So we wanna make sure that students are always getting grade level content and are always being provided that high level core instruction. And so intervention would be the support that would be um, outside of core instruction. It would be providing them that support that's necessary in order to help them to be um, successful within the core. Okay, so when students demonstrate a need for a tier two or three uh, support or intervention, we offer a variety of interventions at every level that address needs from foundational skills to reading comprehension. So all of our programs are evidence-based and research supported per ESSA, and they range in their intensity based on specific student need. So our found, all of our foundational skills programs are backed by the science of reading, and all of our comprehension programs also offer writing support. So the programs that we have currently at elementary, we offer the phonics suite, including Countdown and Blast. 
Uh, th those programs cover foundational skills and then exploring reading and leveled literacy intervention to address comprehension skills. At middle school, we offer Read 180 to address comprehension skills and Phonics Boost, which is a foundational skills program. And at high school, we offer Achieve 3000 for comprehension skills and Phonics Boost again for foundational skills. So you can see the box in the middle of the screen there uh, has four interventions listed and those are HD Word, Language Foundations, Sounds and Syllables, and Individual Intervention Plan. Those programs are all offered at all levels. So HD Word, Language Foundations, and Sounds and Syllables all address foundational skills uh, following the science of reading. And those are all offered from elementary to high school based on student need. So OG Plus is another offering that is a professional learning for special educators. And there are some instances in the county where that program is being used to intervene for students. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the tier two and tier three math interventions that are available at each level. Um, at the elementary level, all four of the interventions which are listed there are evidence-based as well. Number worlds and connecting math concepts are intended to support students who need extra instruction with grade K and one standards, while math navigator and do the math are intended to support students who need extra instruction in grade, um, the standards from grades one through five. At the middle school level, Math Workshop is an FCPS developed um, intervention course. That intervention course is intended to um, parallel what's happening in the grade level classroom where priority prerequisites are being taught and where students are taking a look at um, recycling and revisiting content that has been covered in the grade level classrooms. That, that course is very much supportive of the grade level experience. Um, also at the middle school and high school level, we have our English Learner Math Foundation classes. Those classes are intended for EL students who have either interrupted or limited educational experiences. And those courses are intended to review the most essential standards at previous grade levels um, in a accelerated fashion so that those students can re-enter back into the grade level classroom experience as soon as possible. At the high school level, Algebra at One Acquisitions is a um, is an evidence based program which is infused into the Algebra One course. That is not a pull out program. In addition, it is actually the students receive Algebra One credit, but at the same time have the intervention infused into it. It's really important to understand that that course was um, created about two years ago because FCPS took the initiative to say that all grade nine students would not, there would be no grade nine students who would be enrolled in a below grade level math experience. What that means is we had probably 200 to 250 students uh, who would have traditionally been in below grade level experiences in ninth grade who were now taking algebra. Uh, and that was a, a a real need to make sure that we were supporting the students, we had to have a way to infuse the intervention within the course. Also, um, as Brittany had earlier mentioned, individualized intervention plans are available for all students if the provided courses or programs do not meet student needs. If those are administered at the middle school or high school level, they would occur within the skills enrichment course. And if it would occur at the elementary level, it is a pullout program where it would be a standalone setting. So what, what you've seen here is our, our tiers that uh, we, we operate within and the programs that are available to schools. And so we, we felt in this year we should talk to you about what the, that looked like in a virtual and hybrid setting. Um, and so there was a lot of change this year, um, obviously, in the method of instructional delivery. All of a sudden, teachers and students are on Google Meets and, and learning from home and teaching from home. Um, and amongst all of that change, uh, when, when the time period that was available to them for intervention may have changed, um, how they interacted with students may have changed, uh, our expectations and our guidance for our in intervention programs um, remain the same. Uh, the guidance was given that these programs should be implemented even in this setting to fidelity, uh, progress monitoring, 
um, according to the specific program schedule, still must occur uh, based on the data you get from that progress monitoring, the evidence of student learning should uh, guide your next instructional steps, uh, how you group students should give you the information you need um, to give students the appropriate level of support moving forward. And uh, there you see that instruction purposely developed. It's responsive and deliberate. Uh, what we do with students each and every day uh, is done on purpose uh, to meet the needs that we see uh, based on that progress monitoring data. So just uh, we thought that was important to share that even in a virtual hybrid pandemic year, uh, that guidance was still uh, remain the same. Okay, we uh, determine the effectiveness of our reading interventions using a variety of assessments. So the first is the performance series assessment, which we use at levels two through 10 as our third party measure of both student progress and program su success as per ESSA. Uh, this assessment is a computer adaptive assessment that measures student reading comprehension skills. Next, we use the PARC and MCAP scores uh, to determine if students are transferring their knowledge gained from the intervention into the classroom, because that is the end goal of intervention, is to transfer that knowledge to the classroom. So since performance series isn't normed for grades K through one, and many of the programs that we offer at grades K through two address foundational skills prior to addressing comprehension, we use the Dibbles assessment uh, to determine student growth at those levels. Next. Um, we use the reading inventory, which is a computer adaptive assessment built into the Read 180 program to measure uh, student reading comprehension and lexile growth at the middle school level. And then at the high school level, we also use the course passing rate for students enrolled in intervention in grades nine and 10. All right, for the evidence of the effectiveness for math interventions, uh, we use for grades K through eight, a fall and spring math inventory result. The math inventory is the parallel to the reading inventory. It, instead of receiving a lexile result, it measures a, provides a quantile result. That is also a computer adaptive assessment, third party um, product that we like to use. And it is administered uh, we like to use this in addition to performance series because it has a Spanish read aloud feature that uh, some of the other computer adaptive assessments don't have. And that's very important for many of our students. We also take a look at PARC and MCAP results to make sure that the information that's being taught and learned within the interventions is transitioning to grade level. At the algebra acquisitions course at the high school, we, since it's a high stakes course, um, in graduation requirements associated with it, we like to take a look at those graduation requirements. What percent of the students are passing the course, because that's that's a graduation requirement, and what percent of the students are passing MCAP, because that's a graduation requirement. And as Brittany mentioned, and I previously mentioned, we also this year are doing performance series math, third party computer adaptive assessment in grades one through nine. Okay, so we're gonna jump back actually two years ago, take a look at some math data in regards to effectiveness because last year we were quite surprised and in, in with um, the continuity of learning and really didn't have a way to finish or measure our effectiveness as well as we would have liked last year. So when we do jump back two years ago, we do see in the fall to spring math inventory where it provides not just a quantile but measures growth, the a little bit over 51% per of our students were had met or exceeded their growth expectations. Um, the second set of data point there to talk about is the PARC average scale score change. And what we did here is we took a look at every student in the county who was enrolled in math intervention. And the scale score change from their 18 test to their 19 test was an average of 3.2 points higher than what it was the previous year. When we took a look at the separate, the comparison group of non-intervention students, uh, the non-intervention students increased their scale score by eight tenths of a point. This is really important that our intervention students are outperforming our non-intervention students because if they're ever going to get to grade level, they have to move faster 
and grow faster than the students who are not enrolled in intervention. Um, they cannot maintain the same pace of growth. They have Their growth has to be accelerated. I, I mentioned earlier that uh, we take a look at the passing, course passing rate in park passing rate for algebra acquisitions. And this is some of the data that we're very, we were very pleased with and excited with because we had 200 some students that year that would have never been enrolled in an algebra course. It, they would have waited until 10th grade and we brought them into algebra in ninth grade and 90% of those students met their graduation requirement by passing the course. And um, nearly 28% of the students met or exceeded the park graduation performance level. Our hopes was to be able to take a look, at, our hope was to be able to take a look at a two-year experience um, for the students who didn't pass park the first year who would be re-enrolled in a traditional algebra and we were hoping that we would see a 50% or greater graduation rate or performance um, on the park assessment. Make, helping them meet their graduation requirements. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, um, but we're ready to jump back into this program again next year when we're out of virtual learning. Um, when we take a look at the evidence of effectiveness for this year so far, what we've been utilizing is the performance series. And what we can see at all three levels at mid-year is that all of them are somewhere in the low 50% in terms of students who have either achieved above or far above growth at this point in time. So we're anticipating those values will increase as we move more into a hybrid learning and we're seeing students more face-to-face. -face. We're hoping for you know, increases at all three levels. So when we look at the reading interventions, uh, the first data piece is for performance series gains analysis of their target growth rates. So as mentioned earlier, the performance series is used at levels two through 10 as our third party measure of student progress and program success. So this chart shows the percentage of students who met or exceeded their end of year growth expectations at the mid-year assessment. So you can see we have data from 2018, 2019, 2019 to 2020, and then from this school year. So at the bottom, you'll see uh, Language Foundations has been pulled out explicitly as this program has been of particular interest at former meetings. So this data shows the percentage of students who have demonstrated growth from the beginning of the year to their mid-year assessment, as well as the percentage of students who met their mid-year growth target. So that 62.1% demonstrated growth on the performance series at the mid-year assessment and 49% of them met their middle of the year growth target. Um, this data is a little bit different as we chose to only pull data on students and language foundations who have completed at least 50 lessons of the program. The reason for this is because the performance series measures comprehension and language foundations focuses on foundational skills. So the end goal of all of our programs is to increase reading comprehension. But when we're looking at students who are focusing on foundational skills, it does take slightly longer for that to transfer into uh, growth on comprehension assessments because they're still learning to decode the words on the page. So that's the reason that this data was pulled out specifically. And then also we, we chose to wait until students had made it through 50 lessons of the program. So we knew that they were making progress in the program and they're more likely to be transferring those skills to the classroom once they hit 50 lessons lessons. Okay, so this, uh, this next um, piece of data shows the beginning of the year to the middle of the year Dibble's composite score increase for K through two students who took both administrations of that assessment. So last year, uh, there was an average of 57.8 points increase on their composite score from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year. This year, it was a 52.6 point increase. It was slightly lower this year, but that was a little bit to be expected because of virtual learning. Many of these students took the assessment virtually rather than face-to-face, -face, and it is a one-on-one -on -one assessment that does benefit from being given face-to-face, -face. so we're hoping that next year when we give this again, we'll see a little bit more growth. And then for middle school, uh, we have the fall to spring reading inventory. 
So between 2018 and 2019, 78 percent of our students made lexile gains from the beginning of the year to the end of the year 57 percent of them met their end of year goal and 36 percent of them doubled their end of year goal uh, by the end of the school year in that program for last year remember that this assessment was still given at the end of the year even though we were doing continuity of learning so many of these students hadn't been participating at the same level they would have been when they were in person. So 75% of them still made Lexile gains from beginning to end of year. 43% of them met their end of year goal and 21% of them still doubled their end of year goal in that program last year. Okay, and then finally, uh, we have the high school year-long English pass rate for grades 9 and 10. Um, the high school intervention actually had a change in the model of instruction in the 2019-2020 school year. So rather than being taught as two separate courses, we have woven intervention into the year-long English course to allow for both more flexibility in programming in response to student data and growth, and also to allow students to make quicker transfers of that knowledge between intervention and their coursework. So the pass rate for last year, um, for the fall semester, was 91% of ninth graders and 93% of 10th graders. For this year, that was 80% of ninth graders and 70% of 10th graders. So the pass rate for this year mirrors a lot of our other um, high school courses that we've had during virtual learning. And I know that the Elevate Summer Academy is being designed to support these students specifically based on data such as this. So we're hoping to uh, see different pass rates next year when we're back in person five days a week. And then finally, we have the two years ago, again, like Mike mentioned, you know, we don't have the PARC data or the MCAP data from last year. So in 2018, 2019, the average scale score change for students in grades four through 10 um, in intervention was 5.2. And for non-intervention students, that was a 5.3. So when we're looking at this data, um, this actually shows how our department really responds to data and analyzes what we have and then makes changes based on that data. So since this time, we have actually worked with schools at all levels, elementary, middle, and high school, to either upgrade our intervention offerings at those levels and also working with the schools to help them better use data to place students in more appropriate interventions based on their needs so that we can see more growth because they're in the appropriate intervention. So. I am also disappointed that we don't have data from last year to show um, how those changes have imp have been implemented. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the next administration of MCAP to see how those changes are really affecting student growth. All right, are there any questions for us? Sue or Jason, go ahead, Sue. Yeah, I just I had a couple of questions. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it's always uh, wonderful to see the efforts put in to help ensure our students are achieving success. And I uh, appreciate your work in that. Um, I, I have one very basic question is when do parents become aware that interventions are occurring with their child? That should happen immediately. Um, a parent should always be aware if a student is in an intervention course. So um, teachers should be communicating that information on an ongoing basis. Of course, at the middle school level, they, it actually comes on their schedule. So it'll say that they're enrolled in it. But at the elementary level, it would be a teacher communicating with a parent. And then it is also marked on the report card. It'll say that receives their curriculum with intervention. So okay. it, there is official documentation of it in addition to. But one of the things that they talked about was the ongoing progress monitoring is so critically important and we do want um, schools should be communicating that progress to parents as well throughout the year so parents are aware of how their child is progressing within the intervention and making sure that um, they're be able, being able to exit out of intervention okay thank you i just um my son is in elementary school and i, I have not seen anything about intervention so i guess that means he's performing at, at grade level and i didn't know if he was receiving and I didn't know, so excuse my ignorance on that. Um, the second thing is, is I saw um, the Lexile reading uh, scale and I, I, again, at the elementary level, I, I'm more familiar with um, the one that went by letters. Like what scales do we use for, for reading? 
So the letters you might be referring to were the um, uh, Fontis and Pinnell levels. Uh, we tend to use those a lot less now. Uh, Lexile, I think, is a better science-based approach, uh, and it, that scans all that that can covers a continuum of reading from uh, early acquisition all the way through adulthood. Uh, uh, there also were Rigby levels that you might have seen before, um, uh, but we we typically are kind of leaning towards our Lexile as the best uh, measure right now. And then at the at the acquisition level. Uh, we really use our Dibbles assessment to let us know where kids are as far as acquiring those foundational reading skills. Okay. And and so do we have a standard adopted? Is that part of what this committee does or um, who makes the decisions as to what scales FCPS is using? Yeah. So <laughs> staff normally handles that, um, okay. you know, as far as uh, the uses. Now they're, there, we have a number of assessments that we use with students, and we certainly have the required ones that are in our assessment framework that we use. And then we have what we kind of call drill down assessments. So if a student is flagged on one of our um, framework uh, assessment frameworks, that, that we would then drill down with additional assessments within that. And we provide guidance to all of our staff about those tools. Lexile okay. levels are also standardized by the Common Core state standards. So they, um, they're standardized across grade levels. Uh, they're the same in every state based on the Common Core. Excellent point, Brittany, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, um, and then on slide 14, it said that there's a range of 78 to 75% uh, Lexile gains. And I guess I'm just wondering, Why wouldn't there be like a hundred percent? Does that does that mean there's a possibility that some you know there's twenty five percent of students that don't make any gain? Can you please explain that to me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, it, unfortunately, there are cases where students don't always make Lexile gains um, before the end of the school year. That can be for a variety of reasons, and we do work really closely with schools to monitor that and to kind of try to find those outliers and find what the root cause is of them not making Lexile gains. Those reasons can range from things like uh, not being placed in the correct intervention, which is again, like I mentioned before, something that we've been working really closely with schools to make sure they're placing kids in the correct intervention. Sometimes when students uh, are struggling with foundational skills and they're placed in a comprehension intervention, um, they're not quite ready for the comprehension intervention. And so we don't always see Lexile gains. Also, you know, this is an assessment that students take themselves. It's a computer adaptive self-paced assessment. And so, you know, sometimes students, we can give them the assessment multiple times and um, it just, it, it requires the student to really put forth the effort to, to make those Lexile gains. And sometimes we do see that uh, those, there are outliers, obviously, we don't have a lot of those students. Um, so we don't always have 100%. We do work really closely with schools though, to monitor this data throughout the year and try to help them figure out uh, student by student cases, student by student basis, sorry, um, what the reason is why they're not making Lexile gains and then either move them to a new program or you know contact home and work with that student to work on some of that motivational factor. Okay. Is anybody else struck by the fact that we turn this the other way around, that it's one in four of our students are not making any gains? Well, it certainly is concerning, um, you know, Sue, and thank you for bringing it up because I think it is an important thing for us to talk about. So I really appreciate the question and, the, and highlighting that. It's also important to know that from the school year 18-19, we have made some upgrades within our intervention programming and what intervention is available to students. And so we have added additional foundational programs. Like this is specific to middle school. And so we added specific foundational reading programs at the middle school level that those students may have still been in this Read 180 course and really still are struggling with those foundational reading. We have made sure to upgrade the foundational reading interventions at the middle school level to make sure that they are no longer in the Read 180 comprehension intervention and are instead are in that foundational reading. So it could be that back in 2018-19, we still had some students who were not in the right intervention, but again, we're working closely with them to make sure. And when we look at 2019-20, we know that the end of the year assessment was taken while we were on continuity of learning. Students were at home. 
And so teachers gave them the assessment and we're providing you the data because we wanted to be very transparent with what our data says. We don't want to, to keep that data. So we're being very transparent, but we have to understand it was during continuity of learning. And so students were at home taking that end of year assessment. So we don't truly know what would that percentage have been at the end of last year, knowing that we had made so many upgrades in our intervention programming from 1819 to 1920. So again, that's why we are super excited and we closely monitor this data to make sure that we are seeing those gains because I, just like you, am super concerned if we have one student who is not making gains in reading and we need to know why and what we can do to support that student. So um, thank you for bringing that up, Kevin. Yeah, I, I do wanna point out, of course, that I, I think everybody here understands that you know, of our 44, 44 almost 45,000 students, uh, intervention students in reading is a, a very small subset. And in any individual reading program, it's an even smaller subset. So one of the things that, as Jen is saying, and I agree, we don't want a single kid to not be able to success, be successful reading, which is why we built that multi-tiered system of support. And mm -hmm. sometimes students have to move through there. We don't want to automatically place a student in the most intensive intervention uh, because we have many students who go into one that's less intensive and they do very well. But we monitor and Kyle was mentioning and, and so was Mike and, and Brittany, that progress monitoring is critical. When we really feel like we've uh, not been able to move that student, then it's time to reevaluate and move to that more intensive intervention. So it is a system in the truest sense of the word, a system, lots of moving parts, lots of uh, people involved. Uh, but, you know, again, the overall number of students that we're talking about in some of these percentages are actually quite small. Um, so we, I think we have data on the actual, what we call the N in our statistics, the number uh, that we could provide you as well, right? You know, because when you, when you hear 25%, one in four, that's very alarming. Uh, and again, we want all kids, don't get me wrong here. I don't want anybody to misstate that I'm saying it's okay that we have these kids, but for you as board members to understand that in the scale of our 44 or 45,000 kids, this is a small number and we're meeting very good success with, with many of those students and we just continue to persevere. That's such a great point, Kevin, because we really do, we've actually monitored the percent of our students that are in intervention and we maintain lower than 15% because we don't wanna be over identifying students for intervention. So that's another data point that we do monitor for schools and we look at individual schools to say what percentage are in intervention and we work with them if they have a higher percentage than what the data should indicate. So Kevin's right. When we look at this, it is less than 15% uh, of our students that are without a doubt. I don't even have to go to find the data. I know that it's under 15%. And is that 15% for middle school or is it 15% across the board? Overall. It would be Overall. across the board. Okay. Across the board. Well, we're still talking like 6,000 students. And if one in four, that's sure. just me a large number. I'm sorry. I'm just doing No, it's okay. I understand. Time. I understand. Do you all have goals that you set yeah. as a team, or do we have team goals to say, okay. hey, okay. And I will also say that, you know, yes, it's 15% across the board and, and 6,000 students, but this is only um, middle school students who are enrolled in Read in 180, which is only yeah. one of the intervention programs that we offer at middle school, um, okay. because students who are not enrolled in this program do not take this assessment. It's only, it's part of the program. And we also, we also really encourage schools to do triangulation of data and to never rely on just one data point. And mm -hmm. so, you know, because again, it is it is a computer adaptive assessment that's taken right. by the student. Sometimes there really just are outliers that can't be controlled by the teacher or the school. And you might be surprised that, you know, some of those students when we meet with the schools, because we actually do as a team, we go out and meet with the schools to talk about the students who are not making growth really on a case to case basis. And sometimes it's, well, they're showing growth on the performance series, or they're doing really well on the built in assessments in the program, but they had a, you know, they had a bad day or, you know, they just, didn't want to take that assessment that day. And so really we do have some outlier situations that are just kind of out of the teacher's control. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I appreciate the dialogue in that um, it, it's helping me understand the whole data set and what we're actually specifically looking at. And I think what's most important to me as a board member is to see the immediately jump on, hey, we this is important to us and we're working very hard on it. And that's really all I'm trying to validate. Thanks. And I would say our goal is 100% of students. 
are able to read sure. and, and they're Absolutely. on grade and being successful on grade level. We all have a common goal, which is 100%. We want every student successful on grade level or above because we want acceleration. <laughs> Thanks. Jason, you have questions? Yeah, Mr. J here. Um, uh, thank you all for for providing uh, this information. Um, I, I want to let you know that your work also is highly valuable. Um, it is shown over and over again that students um, who leave the system, um, poor readers. Um, I know math, math is highly valuable for financial budgeting skills and you know maintaining, um, you know, financial fluid, you know, um, you know solvency in life, but. Um, readers, especially, um, it's shown that, 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 that a pipeline to um, criminal activity because you know, it's really linked to poor reading. And so it is just, um, I, I don't want to put any more stress on you that you probably already put on yourselves. Like I hear from what, what you're doing, you, what you're doing very seriously, but it is so monumentally important that our students do not leave as poor readers um, because it, 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 is, it is a little bit of social, social detriment to all of us. Our, our kids are our future, and if they're not reading well, we're all in trouble. Um, but I want to thank you for the information you're making. Um, while you were presenting, a lot of my questions were um, were, were, were being met. So I, I do have um, a high level of, um, you, you provided comfort and confidence while you're speaking because a lot of my concerns that I've seen happen in the county, um, I, I feel like there's a new guard in place. So I want to thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, I've seen um, with, with my own child who is uh, gifted, I've seen him misidentified. Um, he was told that I walked in, he was doing multiplication in like a second or first grade because his mother, um, you know, she, she formally taught math and, um, he, I knew he was accelerating that cause he's working work, work with mom and we come in and he, he were told that, oh, he, 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 he's, um, he's remedial. I'm like the same kid who was doing multiplication. I'm like, I don't understand. And so we went to the principal and we asked a few questions and we had him move to a different classroom. And then boom, ever since then he's been GT, you know, now he's doing, um, he's in eighth grade doing high school math. Um, he'll, he'll be done with his high school math requirement the end of this year. But he, I was told he was remedial a couple of years back. So I had a real strong problem um, with misidentification. I had a student I worked with at Thurman Middle School. She came in, she was a transfer student. And I do have a question to you about this. She came as a transfer student and she was placed into her remedial courses. I taught this student and I'm like, this kid is not remedial, not a chance. And so I went to her IEP meeting or, or whatever meeting we had, and, and I advocated for her. She was moved over, and she successfully, you know, she did she did wonders. Actually, she I just wrote her recommendation for her on college um, about two years ago, and she's off off in college. So I really had some concerns about um, misidentification, but I keep hearing you mentioning um, that you that you, that you continually reevaluate. So those things are making me feel comfortable about like you know we're not missing kids in the cracks. But I had to be known because it's very important that we were mindful that kids are misidentified um, and that, that we make sure that we the kids who are needing intervention receive those. And kids who who are, you know, progressing and may have just, you mentioned before, Brittany, there was a um, kids who have maybe life occurrences that they, maybe they're having off, you know, for something ha bad happened at home. I have a student before who had a fire at home. If he had a test that day, he wouldn't have done well. So we have to be mindful that life life happens. So I heard a lot of great things we were presenting um, that really get to the heart of, of making sure that we, we're, we're giving our kids what they need. And I want to thank you for that. Um, I had a question in terms of um, just creativity. Um, a lot of times, you know, I mentioned you, you guys seem like a, a great new guard, but um, you may have students who, who may have come to us um, beforehand or who are just maybe at the high school level and they're not um, unfortunately going to be um, currently fluid in, in reading or math. Are we being creative and maybe offering them skill set programs, like fast tracking them in the skill set program so that when they leave us, it breaks my heart if we have a student who leaves us and can't feed themselves. Yeah, I think we're always trying to make sure that we have appropriate programs for students and to make sure that they have those opportunities to explore and to grow in the, in the areas that will help them and prepare them for college and career readiness. So I think absolutely that's a focus that we have and making sure that we always have um, opportunities for students and then helping them to, to get to those opportunities so that they can be successful and prepared. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to see something where I don't know where we can expand TTC. Everybody kind of wants wants that. 
Um, but I'd really like to see some kind of a uh, fast track where we have students who we know are are struggling with me, being highly proficient for college education, but we can get them. Um, we can make sure because some of our kids don't leave us with family support. Some of our kids leave us and they're on their own. And if if they can't have skills that provide for them, I hate to see STP as graduate, you know, in the lurch. I, I just so I'm very particular. I, I like to see us make sure, you know, if we don't catch somebody, we 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 find a creative way to make sure we provide for them. Um, but I want to tell you, um, from what I've seen here with the evaluation and with the uh, university, seems to be very data driven. And I, 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 I again, I heard a lot of great things. So what you're doing, you, you have provided me confidence and comfort. I do appreciate that. And I know the parents do as well. Um, I want to thank you for what, what you're doing. I had one question kind of off topic, just out of curiosity. Uh, Brittany, do you have any relation to Tina Garst? You know, I actually get that question a lot, and um, I don't think so. It's my married name, but I don't think that Tina is related to the Garsts that um, that I'm related to. So I do, I get that question a lot, especially when I'm up in Thermont. Yes. <laughs> People ask me, are you related to Tina Garst? But I don't, I don't think I am. I, you know, we've never met either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should find her. <laughs> sweet. You'd like her. <laughs> Um, but yes, thank you very much for what you're doing. I, I saw a lot of things here that um, meets uh, a lot of what my concerns were. I did have one question though. Um, if we get a student who is, uh, say, uh, transferred from another county or another state, um, and maybe they haven't taken the doubles or or, or, or assessment that we, we, we use, how are we grafting them into our, what are we using metrics to get them into our system? Kai, were you gonna go ahead and take that Yeah, one? I was gonna say for something that I saw your mic click on. Um, so we first we will look at what data comes to us from from the school we're receiving them from because they may have a lot of similar assessments or if they're not the same assessments it might be an assessment like ours it might be a, a computer adaptive assessment that is similar to something we offer so we may have some data that we can use upon uh, entering them into our system and there's also a uh, part of entering a student into a school there are some short assessments that we may ask them to take to make sure that we can get them off on the right foot and, and look at what the proper placement and programming would be um, upon them starting at our school. And then of course, then you, you click into the progress monitoring and, and seeing how they're doing and adapting in FCPS and see if we need to uh, do any follow-up assessments or if we need to reevaluate uh, where we've placed them. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, thank you all very much. I get, are you related to John Yoho a lot at Brunswick? And we are not, Yoho, go figure. Um, early on, Kyle, you mentioned student services team and um, mm -hmm. attendance. And this takes me way back to when Dr. Cuppet was my AP and I had a student who was frequently late. You remember that? And you were on the phone and it was all going well and, and then it fell apart. And two, that was a third grader. Two years later, that student was still coming in late many mornings as a fifth grader I ran into her. And so at the elementary level, it was always a frustration. Are there more, I mean, they get to middle and high, you'll fail courses if you miss so much, but elementary, there was very little we could do. So are there more things now or is it still a frustrating situation? Well, I can speak to my experience and my experience is at the middle school level, um, sitting in on those SSTs and talking about tardiness or absent. Uh, students and you know we, we, the guidance counselor may have reached out to the family we may have tried to uh, talk to the student you know getting feedback from them about why it's difficult to get to school um, our SS uh, I'm sorry our PPW is a, is a very uh, important role there in working with the family and getting kids to school and getting kids to school on time um, if anybody wants to add to those procedures you can but that that's yeah. what i've seen in those scenarios and yeah the, yeah go ahead dr Cuppet. Yeah, we still i mean that's still a challenge at the elementary level you know there's 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 all kinds of supports that you can put in place because sometimes the, the the challenge we face often at the elementary level is sometimes the reason the child's late is not because of the kid themselves yep you know it can be a family uh dynamic associated with when a parent goes to work or you know i i've had uh several students whose parents worked overnight shifts 
and you know just slept in and 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 so there are some challenges associated with that but all schools have a system in place where they look at uh, attendance and tardiness just like they look at things like behavioral um, challenges referrals uh, suspension they monitor all those uh, points of data and put a number of things in place to try to incentivize and work with students yeah uh, so yeah that that continues to be a challenge and uh, I, I do think that for there is a small subset of students who have uh, I have what I would call tardiness and attendance challenges that may be dealing with something very significant. Like uh, I had a student who had very difficult time coming to school on days when there were thunderstorms because he was involved in a very tra traumatic car accident. Mm -hmm. So I really had to work with that parent because that student at that point in his life, now that eventually faded as he moved through our school, uh, but it was very acute and it was trauma that was documented by a doctor. So we really worked out a system where uh, we kind of did virtual school a little bit before virtual school was in because that was what was right to do for that kid. So in his in his uh, second grade year, there were about four or five days where I kind of used kind of administrative um, discretion to try to help the student because his his response to thunder was 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 very significant. So there are some rare cases like that where I think maybe down the road, Miss Yoho, uh, having virtual operate uh, uh, offerings for students might be in the best interest of that child and that family because of some very atypical situations that they're going through. And so that is one thing that we've kind of learned from our pandemic experience is that for many students, this digital virtual environment in connection with the school is actually better support for them than attending physically. And so, you know, we, we think being in school has an ideal component to it, but you always got to meet kids where they are. And, uh, and, and attendance and tardy will always be a challenge for public schools, but I always feel like we have better and better strategies as years move on. Kevin, I, I believe I had that student in sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, because I know that does include more than just intervention, very much the PPWs and all, but, but that came up early in the presentation. Uh, Brittany, you said something about uh, data from MCAP. I retired in 2018, but have we given the MCAP yet? Or, okay, I just want to make sure you were talking about PAR. Looking forward to it. Yes. Yeah. You finally get to give it. I'm I very agree. much looking forward to it. <laughs> I was in all the iterations of state testing until MCAP, and I'm like, wait a minute, have we given that one yet? Okay. I thought COVID very much got in the way. Um, thank you. Um, let's see. I'm trying to stay on time. Just a couple of other questions. Um, I'm interested in the algebra one um, because I know for myself, it, my dad's a, a retired nuclear physicist and, I, and then I have children. One daughter got a bachelor's in math. The other had to take algebra one in two parts. So the gamut, but for myself, algebra was like a dark tunnel and eventually the light came on but i think it's very much developmental so i'm interested in um the fact that you moved it down but you have the support in place and it seems to be um having good results yes um the algebra one acquisitions we utilize a program from agile mind and the I think really the big difference of why this program is successful is it is taught very differently from our traditional Algebra One class. It is uh, a lot of spatial visual rec recognition. It's really truly uh, focused on developing conceptual understanding with maybe fewer topics um, so that students have that base understanding of algebra concepts um, that allows them to move forward. Because, you know, when we talk about foundational skills at the elementary level, you know, being able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, those, those are essential as you move forward into upper elementary grades and middle school. Really, algebra one skills is the foundation of all higher level math. Um, so building, you know, we have a lot have a lot of students who are very procedurally fluent without having conceptual understanding of what they're doing so the the program really focuses on the conceptual uh, building the conceptual understanding so that when a student forgets what the procedure is they have something that they can recall on I, like, um, i'm sorry miss yoho but mike if i recall too in my conversations with some of the teachers who were doing this program 
The program itself also has some kind of like mindset and almost social emotional components to it because what will happen to students as they move through their mathematics story is some of them will come to believe that they're just not a mathematics capable right. student. And that, that tends to happen more in mathematics than in ELA. And one thing I like about this program that Mike and the teachers and our math folks designed and, and implemented is it does target some of that. It kind of changes the math story for students and allows them to see themselves as being able to progress mathematically. And that, that's really what great teachers have done all the time. Uh, but to have a program that has an emphasis in that and makes that a forward part of what um, teachers and students interact on um, has been helpful in, in, I think, building efficacy in these students. Correct. And one of the, you know, at the program sort of refers to those students as math casualties as they've come in. They, they have, you know, they're, they're hurt mathematically within themselves and they don't view themselves as being math people. And a lot of our teachers, when we first began the program, you know, teachers are always looking, how can I move through this a little bit quicker um, they they were targeting oh we can get rid of you know maybe we can eliminate some of these growth mindset lessons that, that pop up on occasion and what they found out was those were the most essential lessons those were the lessons that were sort of like um, trampolines that push them into the next set of lessons and help motivate them um, and a lot of self-evaluation uh, occurs uh, throughout the program and you know it at the end of the first year, um, when we were talking about adjustments we wanted to make, it was put more emphasis on building um, the math identity of our students. Excellent. I would love to uh, come see that class. So get in touch and, and go, go see it because I think that's that's great. Um, yeah, and Marilyn Burns wrote a whole book on how people say, right. oh, I'm not good at math, and they're not ashamed to admit that when they would be ashamed about reading. So Right, uh, and I'll put a plug in that with Marilyn Burns, we yeah. have adopted her Do the Math program at the at the elementary level. That is from, um, that's all of her work, and it has turned into the um, most used intervention program at the elementary level. Yeah, I was going to say, if you're talking Marilyn Burns, you're talking our language. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I, I have the book. Um, two other really quick things. I just wanted to clarify if anybody is watching. Oh, gee, that's Orton Gillingham Plus, correct? And my niece actually is a special ed teacher in the county and said that she's teaching. I said, oh, Language Foundation? She said, no, Orton Gillingham Plus. So I'm, I did know about that. And last question. Uh, probably for you, Dr. Cuppet, we're looking at the digital curriculum elementary mathematics program that we're going to, I'm sure, approve uh, at the board meeting later. How does that fit into um, this or does it not? So, um, well, we hope it all fits together, Ms. Yoho. So this will be, uh, so if you remember, we had a program several years ago called 10 Marks. Yes. And 10 Marks was part of our base, a supplement to our base program. So uh it it was pulled the uh, amazon web service was responsible for that that product and they they basically killed it and it was right. it created great gnashing of teeth across the united states uh, i actually there was a it actually trended on twitter <laughs> nationally because teachers were like what do you mean you're going to stop doing it so we, um uh, dr marco had asked us to try to find a replacement for that well what most people didn't realize is that 10 marks was probably one of the best digital cu curriculum tools I had ever seen, right? And our, my math folks affirmed that. I thought it was fantastic. And it was a bit of a, it was kind of a Mercedes Benz program. But because Peterson Cotta had a, an early relationship with that, we got it, we got it for about the price of a Civic. So we were able to, we were able to get that in it because we were an early district that was adopting it. So we got it at a very low cost. Well, when that ended, uh, the amount of money that we really had to continue with was not going to get us a tool that was maybe at that level. So we, we brought Study Island in um, and we've had that for the last couple of years. Um, it's OK. Um, it is a civic. Uh, it does kind of get kids from point A to point B mathematically. But we heard from a lot of our teachers that they very much miss the kinds of features that we had in 10 marks. Um, so adaptability, some of the uh, tutorials that will occur. So if the students have a difficulty, they get a little mini tutorial from there, uh, the way the back end data works. So there were all these features that we heard from teachers that they really liked. So as a result of, of us anticipating that we really need to accelerate learning, 
we felt that with our grant dollars, getting now something back to the caliber of 10 marks was going to be important. And so that's what will be coming to you as our request for that approval. Okay, very good. Yeah, I didn't teach math then to my uh, great sorrow, um, but I oh, did hear the teachers uh, saying, ah, don't take 10 marks away. So, um, well, thank you very much. And Lexia Core people, I'm sorry we cut a little bit into your time, but uh, we can we can go over if we have to, just a few minutes. So thank you very much, Intervention people. And Ms. Johnson, yes, it is absolutely, it's in every school improvement plan with numbers as to the progress you're going to make. And so it, it's always, always being monitored and, and in the goals for the whole system. And these are the folks that, uh, that help keep that at the forefront. So thank you for very much for what you do. We're Thank not, you. I appreciate it. Yep. And the intervention team is free to roam the planet. So if you guys <laughs> hop off, this is this is like this is the equivalent of leaving the boardroom to go back to your cube. So that's right. But get to it. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. So um, so I am the Lexia presenter. So I don't think this will run the whole time. I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen here. And um, well, I think I want to share the screen. All right, here we go. So I'm here to talk to you, um, and, and really as an update, um, can you guys confirm that you can see the presentation? Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. So um, Lexia Core 5, this is really good an update to the Curriculum Instruction Committee, but I wanna provide just a little quick background. H had you been on the Curriculum Instruction Committee for the last seven, seven years when I was serving as the liaison, you would have heard me communicate to the committee that one of our goals in personalizing learning for students is to have high quality digital ecosystem, a series of interconnected digital tools that will help teachers get their jobs done. They have to be high quality and we want them to have high efficacy. And so over the years, just like the 10 marks to now what we're recommending today, you'll see as iReady, we have been looking to find these high quality tools because uh, technology is not done for technology states, is our sake. It has to fit with our core program, has to be easy for teachers and kids to use, and it has to have efficacy. And so this is just one little piece of that digital ecosystem uh, puzzle. So Lexia Core 5, you can see a kind of an explanation of what the program is here. Uh, one of the things that we like about it is that it's differentiated and adaptive. So each kid's experience is going to be very different based on how they assess into it. It's research proven. It ties to the science of reading and it targets those big six areas of instruction, uh, including foundational skills and comprehension. And what's great is, is it has tutorials and feedback throughout it so that students can have a, a, a very individualized experience. And so I'm going to stop sharing this and share a new screen with you so that you can just watch a very brief video. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh. Hold on just one second. All right. All right. And if you can confirm once this is up that you can see the start page for the video, I would appreciate it. Yes. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play on this and just give you a, a little bit of a quick tour. Blended learning can be implemented in many different ways. At the core of blended learning, though, is the combination of face-to-face -face instruction and online learning. In elementary school classrooms, the rotation model is one of the most common blended learning models. The rotation model can be implemented in three distinct ways, as station rotations, lab rotations, or individual rotations. In all rotation models, students cycle through various learning activities, using technology and working online in at least one activity. An ideal blended learning program enables teachers to utilize data from students' online learning to inform small group or full class instruction, group projects, and pencil and paper assignments. Core 5 is an adaptive literacy program for grades pre-K through 5 that seamlessly fits into all three rotation model implementations. Whether it's implemented in a classroom or computer lab setting, Lexia's personalized learning model can help you implement blended learning with Core 5 as a part of your everyday literacy instruction. Here's how it works. 
The process begins with your students working independently online to develop their fundamental reading skills on desktop computers, iPads, and Chromebooks. As students work independently, Core 5 gathers real-time, norm-referenced, and criterion-referenced data without stopping instruction to administer a test. Teachers and administrators have access to simple, real-time reports that serve as a data-driven action plan, telling you which skills students have mastered and where students need instruction, pinpointing the exact skill you need to teach, and prioritizing students at the greatest risk of reading failure. Based on this data, teachers are provided with targeted instructional and practice materials. In your blended learning classroom, while some students are pulled aside for direct instruction using Lexia lessons, students can work independently or collaboratively to further develop automaticity and expand their expressive skills using Lexia skill builders and Lexia instructional connections. If you're looking for an easy and highly effective way to personalize instruction for your students, using real-time data and targeted resources, consider incorporating Core 5 into your current or future blended learning classroom. I like it. Yeah, so um, as, as Ms. Yoho can attest to here, uh, rotations have been in place in elementary school for as long as I've been in education, right? And one of the uh, one of the the challenges of those rotation is uh, teachers would have to plan for whole group instruction, and then they would have to plan for each of their reading groups, and then they might have to plan for writing. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in an elementary classroom. What we're trying to use Lexia for is um, a way to help teachers get their jobs done. So I'm going to go back to uh, the presentation now and talk about how this fits in what we do because. It's important for the board to understand that Lexia is not the tool, it is a tool that we're using. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit more about Lexia. As you heard uh, our intervention folks talk about that evidence of e efficacy. So what is the evidence level? Actually, Lexia Core 5 has eight studies that are at the strong level under ESSA for evidence, four at moderate and 10 at promising. Of all the tools that we have, I think this is probably the one with the greatest research base. Um, the backstory on this is this, this was actually created by a parent who was trying to, to help his own child learn to read. And so he worked with some experts to develop a system, which later eventually became Lexia. They got received some federal grant funds and they built this program. So this was a program built originally from the heart is what I like to say. And so the research base behind this is very high. I feel very confident about this particular product. Now, here's how it all fits together. We've been trying to move towards a program founded in the science of reading. And we've been doing that three ways. As you know, we have now put in a core foundational skills program at kindergarten through second grade. And we actually just in the pandemic were able to add Launchpad, which is a phonological program for our pre-K students. And that program moves kids from pre-K through grade two, going through Countdown, Blast, and HD Word, you'll see here. That is a, a program that is designed to explicitly and systematically teach our foundational skills. And this has been an area that um, we really needed to strengthen in our program, and we're seeing a lot of positive benefits. In addition, we have been providing the letters course uh, for our teachers for the last couple of years. And we've had hundreds of teachers go through uh, units one through four. I think we're probably almost at 100 teachers who by the end of this year will be through um, the first course, which includes units one through four, very heavy focus on foundational skills. And we've had about 120 teachers go through uh, units five through eight. This is um, science of reading, uh, driven learning and, and uh, teachers are able to receive um, either hood graduate credit for going through this or Maryland State Department of Education credit. So we're now building capacity of our teachers in the science of reading. And then over in Core 5, we've brought in Lexia Core 5 to allow teachers to use this as part of their adaptive blended learning model. And I'm sure Ms. Yo could also attest to the idea that as part of that rotations that were done in the past, uh, teachers would often have 
a computer station, right? They would have them go over and work on language arts related um, uh, software. What's different now is the software that we have available today is very high powered. It's, it's, very, it's adaptive. It has these uh, data features that teachers can see exactly what students are able to do. And there's a resource group um, of materials. Uh, so if the third grade teacher realizes I have a handful of students who are um, showing weakness in a skill, and by the way, that's probably evident when they're working with them in small group, that they have a group of resources that they could go to to be um, offline. And you saw in the video that that could be done collaboratively. I'm going to assign that to that group while they're in a station where they're working collaboratively. Or I may assign it for that student to do individually. Teachers need to be able to conduct the orchestra, but they don't always have to go out and create their own violin and their own trumpet and the, all these things. We need to be able to give them high quality resources. And that's where I think Lexia serves as a component of what we do. So to give you a little background on the, the Lexia story here is it, it was being used in a few schools prior to 2018. And then we did some multi-grade classroom work in 1819, and we we thought this would be a great tool for those teachers to be able to meet the the needs of students. When I have, for instance, both second and third graders in my class, this was occurring in a lot of our smaller schools, and so we felt this would be a good tool. So we did a field test, and the feedback from teachers, students, and in men, and in some cases, some of our parents was very positive. So we did a data analysis in spring of 20, and it showed a strong correlation between when the kids meet their recommended target time. So a student A might be targeted for 40 minutes, student B might be targeted for 60 minutes. So when they met those target times, there was clear advancement in the program. And so when the pandemic hit, we all remember that fateful day in March when schools were closed, Lexia raised their hand and said they would give free licenses to the entire district when we through the school closure. And we took that opportunity to do that because we really felt that in the pandemic, we needed a good digital tool that students would be able to access on their Chromebooks at home. We, we not only do we think it was an important tool for the teacher, but we believed it was an important tool for families because what we found in much of our usage data is that students were meeting not only meeting the time that the, the program said they should meet, but you could see mom and dad or grandma or Aunt Sally or whoever was at home was having, were having kids go on and do some more Lexia work. Uh, and we were assuming to try to help keep skill sharps for students, you know, to allow progress during this time. Um, our usage rates were the second highest in the nation in Frederick County Public Schools. And they work with districts all across the United States. So they were really blown away as a, as a company that we were in this, this group of these um, top districts that were using this. And so that's when we, at the end of the year, um, we actually purchased out of last year's FY funds, uh, the, the licenses that we're currently using. Uh, so we felt that we, we needed to commit some dollars to this because of the efficacy that we were seeing with this program. Now, in navigating the program, in fall of 2020, we, we tried to complete this com the training. And again, it's pandemic, so it was not ideal, but we completed um, multiple large virtual trainings, and we put these training materials in what we call our hub, the hub. It's actually a, a, a central site that teachers can go to to learn about a number of our digital tools, what we call our kind of our flagship or our core tools. And so these materials, training materials, are available for teachers to go back and access at any time at their convenience. Then we asked Lexia, as part of our deal, to engage in partnerships with our elementary school staff. And so the Lexia team has a small implementation team, and they would go out and they would meet with the school administrator, they might meet with the literacy specialist, assistant principals, whoever was on that team, and they'd say, all right, what's our plan here at Ballinger Creek Elementary or at Carroll Manor Elementary, how are we going to roll this out in our school? And that level of support really proved to be critical because now schools could tailor the implementation to the needs that they had. Um, they, the Lexi implementation team has met with all but two or three, and the two or three schools that they have not met with 
are the two or three schools that we felt had the best start a few years ago. So they were all already experienced with the tool. So the initiative, and this is very important, and I know I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here, our work with Lexia this year was really balanced against these demands of virtual and hybrid instruction. So did the implementation occur in the way that we hoped it would? Yes, if you, if you manage your expectation for the fact that we were in a pandemic. Had this been a typical year, um, we would have loved to see usage rates be higher. We would have loved to see more students make more progress, uh, but we knew that it was in this the, the unusual context of this pandemic. But having said that, let's talk a little bit about what we did see. So Lexia Core 5 has usage definitions uh, for this point in the year, and I would say that this presentation was completed uh, probably mid-March uh, to get ready for today's meeting. So they define meeting usage as students who use that core five up until this point for a minimum of 10 weeks and met their weekly usage targets for at least half of that time. Now, many of our students had used it for more than 10 weeks, but remember schools implemented and some of them might have implemented in September or maybe even as, as late as early October as they spun up this hybrid model. So that, that's what they call meeting usage. And then any student who simply ends the program has met usage. So those tend to be some of our, our stronger readers. So 47% of our students in our elementary program had met the usage. The partial usage definition you can see there is for fewer than six weeks in meeting their time. So about 15% of our students were there. And then not meeting usage, students who use the program for a minimum of 10 weeks, but they did not meet their targets, right? So they, they might have used it for a minimum of 10 weeks, but only met 25% of their target time. 38% of our students could be described by that. Now, again, this is from the beginning of the school year until about uh, the early March period. Now, how did it go? So if we have 47% who met their usage, and we have the remainder who did not, they were either a partial or not meeting, how did it turn out? So you can see that the students who were identified in the green here as meeting usage, which is 7,872 of our students, advanced 17 skills or more in the program. If they were not meeting usage or even in partial usage, which was under, under that six week threshold, you can see that it was nine skills or three skills respectively. So you're not gonna make a lot of progress in the program if you're not in there. And that's, that's, that, that, is, that proved to be true in our spring analysis previously, and we see it now. Now, how does this interpret to actual performance? You know, what is 17 skills? So this one I think is a very compelling uh, uh, statistic, and I hope you can see this. I know our, our board members probably have this up on our computer, but so this shows those, these are the students who were meeting usage versus the students who were not meeting usage or were partial. So again, 7,872 students. Remember we have about 20,000 uh, elementary students in uh, pre-K through grade five. So of the meeting usage students, 71% of those students advanced one or more grade levels in material. And if you look over here to the right, at the start of this school year, we had 45% of our students who were working in the student grade and a small percentage above that in the dark blue who were beyond. By again, the beginning of March, uh, that group of students that are now working beyond had increased to 38%. And the students who were within grade uh, jumped to 50, which means we dramatically reduced the number of students. It was 41% at the beginning of the year that were one grade level below. And there was a smaller percentage that were two grade level below. And so the goal here is to shrink the gray. And those students who are meeting that usage did that. Now, those students who were not meeting or making partial year usage still saw gains. You still see an increase in a shrinking of the gray, but not nearly as dramatically to those students who were in the program. Now, I do want to give a shout out that, remember, Lexia is a part of our program. The hard work our teachers did in Google Meets and the work the parents did over shoulder of their students, all of that plays a part in a student's reading success. But we do think that this data is very telling. So having said that, 
what do we see our next steps in? Well, we're going to encourage usage this summer for families as kind of a, it's a resource that's available to them. It's paid for. Parents don't have to do anything but other encourage the kid to go get on and use that, uh, use that tool. And we, we are going to see that this summer, I guarantee you. We need to communicate the findings that are in this presentation. You guys get the first look as board members to our school leaders and our literacy specialists. And we'll do that immediately uh, following this work. We are going to provide usage reports to our school leaders. So school leaders need to understand, you know, which students are participating and which ones are not. And to be honest with you, I really believe now that we're back hybrid, we're going to see usage go up because we can get in, see where kids are, get in, get them in and used to the program, troubleshoot any technical difficulties, uh, and then get kids uh, moving on the program. So I think the second half of the year, we're going to see an increased usage. So we're going to also provide some additional support for data analysis for our literacy specialists. So they're the literacy leaders in the building. And during the pandemic, uh, how teachers were using that data really varied from uh, you know, teacher to teacher, but it was clear that the teacher login, so this is when the teacher is going to go in and do something in Lexia, that clearly arose uh, throughout the entire pandemic as more teachers got comfortable with the tool. Uh, and we're going to do this all within the context of clarifying our instructional model. So the role of the foundational programs, we're going to be making some adjustments in comprehension at the at, at starting at grade three. And, uh, you know, how does this fit in with, with what teachers have been learning in the letters program? We're going to clarify that. Uh, and so that teachers will understand the role of Lexia Core 5 in our program. So that's the update I wanted to provide for you related to Lexia Core 5, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? Uh, yeah, if, if you don't mind me going, uh, I don't know if you all saw my son pop in. Uh, he caught a little bit of the Lexia um, Core 5 presentation. And so I, I'm an active uh, overseer of it. and. I really enjoy it. And I just asked him what he liked the most about it. And uh, he said that it gives him encouragement when he's reading um, and that they get digital badges. So I know they seem that might not seem like a big deal, but th that was something that he specifically mentioned because I think, I can't remember if it's Splash Learn. There's another system that they use. If, if you make too many mistakes, you have to start the whole level over again. And I thought one day he was going to cry when he made a couple of mistakes and he had to go backwards. So I think we've had a real positive experience with um, the, the, the Lexia um, Core 5 program. So I would encourage uh, keeping it. I think it helps us in whatever em uh, teaching environment we're in, whether we're hybrid, face-to-face, -face, or virtual. So I think it's a good tool to have in the tool bag for whatever we have to face in the future. And then my, my only question would be is what kind of license um, – are we locked? Are we locked? Not, I don't want to say locked into, but I think that uh, they were acquired. Lexia was acquired, and it always makes me nervous when you have yeah. new ownership that is yeah. going to change the licensing fee. I just know, like when we went to Blackboard at FCC, we made a big investment in it, and then like our our subscription rate went like through the roof. So, um, you know, so yeah. can you elaborate on that? So they were acquired by a, a, a larger company called Cambrium. I think is how you pronounce that. Um, what, what, what I actually see as promising about this is they've also acquired letters. Now, when we started our letters journey and when we started our Lexia journey, they were not even related as companies. Um, uh, uh, Lexia was under Rosetta Stone, which we all know to be language related things. Uh, so now that they're under this, what it seems to me and my conversations with Lexia is that the broader company wants to be provide a number of solutions for the move to the science of reading. Like they are they are kind of forerunners in this and that very much fits with where we're headed as a district. Um, at this point, I'm not hearing anything about um, license increases, uh, but we did pay for this year's out of last year's FY. And so I do have a budget request in for the current budget that, that, um, that you all approved. And then when it comes back across the street from the county, uh, you'll see that request is in there to now continue that um, that purchase for us. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
Yeah, that's a good question, Sue, because I, I love when companies improve things. So it's and you're like, why well, like the old one? Um, so it, that is a concern, like you say, just the license uh, costs. So that's good to know. But it seems like they're now focusing on that. And I'm looking up uh, Lexia Core. Um, so he worked with Orton and Gillingham <laughs> to develop it so that's very interesting um Familiar your name right yes yes because I, I was looking like oh let's see who he worked with what were the experts it's like oh yeah orton and gillingham um so those are very familiar interesting i'm wondering if his son is a reporter for ap now called jonathan lemire but i can't find a connection except they're both from like massachusetts so and they'd be about the right age but uh anyway interesting um uh, mr j do you have any questions no, from looking at it, um, I, I liked it from the from the beginning. Um, I can only imagine the um, level of work that teachers who are elementary educators put in for uh, stations. Bless their heart. Um, <laughs> bless their heart. But it has something in real time that um, I hear that now that actually encourages students. But that prov providing of um, dedicated content areas where students are are, are, are missing, and then providing, um, you know handouts and guidance to things they can do right away in real time that is phenomenal and so my only question is is that possible for other content areas sorry um, yeah, that's, but, yeah uh, so, so mr john mr j we are when we look at vetting our digital tools and, and and making decisions about them uh this access to additional resources is part of what we put into like an rfp proposal or what have you it really varies from tool to tool about how robust or rich that tends to be. But the model in these digital spaces now tends to be um, high quality, adaptive digital, mm -hmm. embedded assessment. I will tell you, I asked a kid one time, how are you doing on your Lexia tests? And the kid said to me, we don't have Lexia tests. Nice. Like, he didn't perceive that he was being assessed the whole time. Right. And I thought that was a very telling answer from uh, maybe a second or third grader, right? Perfect. So we look for that adaptive, we look for the embedded assessment, we look at the user-friendly uh, data portal, right? So, because, you know, if you, if you have a very confusing interface for teachers, teachers don't have time to try to slice and dice this and that. They want to know skills, buy kids, boom, 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 where are the tools? That, that's a very smooth process within Lexia. And that can vary from, from tool to tool. But the, the idea of this go and grab resources that are already vetted and tied to the curriculum and those and teachers can use with confidence um, is important because look, what do teachers do? They collaborate, they go to places like Teachers Pay Teachers. Yep. You know, that's, that's a, it makes sense to wanna get your job done more efficiently. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that these tools are tied to our program and are embedded with with the Lexia product itself. Absolutely, yeah. It reminded me of a, a lot of, a, um, I guess, a, a updated version of uh, when I taught uh, middle school um, science. I used a uh, Science Explorer from uh, Pierce Hall, and that was it. Was I had to do all the analyzing and, and um, assessing myself, but the right. tears were there. This right here is doing that for you, yeah. and you're able to. Ha That's. I mean, honestly, we just had a presentation from the um, team for intervention. This device is going to help us prevent kids needing intervention because it'll, it'll help them in the classroom before you get to that point. So that's just amazing. Yeah. And, and Mr. J, that's an important part of the upgrades that we're doing right now in our base program because uh, we can we can um, lay out that multi-tiered system of supports. But if our base program is not founded in the science of reading, what was the point in the first place? Right. Mm -hmm. So all of the changes that we're making right now are preventative. They're based on the science of reading, and we're starting to see the gains that that uh, we're expecting, and that's even in a pandemic. So, I, I can't wait till things normalize a little bit, and, and we can really um, use this increased teacher capacity and these high quality digital curriculum to to really leverage the the. And I will tell you, Lexia is adamant in all of their work that the core of a strong elementary uh, literacy program is the classroom teacher. They 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 recoil at the idea that you would go play quote stick a kid on lexia mm -hmm. because because the way it's designed it requires this teacher intervention so i'll just give you one example so if if a student's has struggling and having difficulty the first thing that happens is the teacher gets an alert that okay so here's kevin he's over here working on this skill 
but we get an alert and we kind of hold the kid rather than sending them back in the program as as miss johnson was pointing out you're on hold and then the teacher is alerted and their job is to pull that student into live instruction and do that work immediately with them do a little bit of reteaching around that skill mm -hmm. unclick the freeze and then the student goes back into Lexia. That's a high fidelity program that allows a teacher to be part of that conversation with what's happening in the digital space. That's so we think that's a real strength of this particular program. No, I would definitely agree. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I used to really like Accelerated Reader and there was one other. And um, I know that the curriculum specialist for language arts that came in after did not and took it away. But I I found, and you would know some of the kids at, at Twin Ridge, um, it especially um, elementary boys because of sort of the competing against themselves mm -hmm. um, aspect of, of there were 10 question tests, but um, it, somebody kicked into reading every year because of that. And that's what Pete Storm, you know, that's all he wanted. So was it a reading program in and of itself? No, but, you know, right. on the side, I had really good success with it. And so it's nice to hear, um, you know, Sue say her son, you know, likes the badges. And that's all like that game theory and yep. the good parts that we see with uh, the motivation, you know, in Facebook or, or Instagram, I guess for, for kids, it's the whatever, I don't do Instagram, but it's the likes, the follows. And so getting the badges that they know that psychologically is uh, stimulating the brain and, and getting kids to keep going. So that's wonderful and that kids don't know they're being tested. Um, you know, whatever, whatever works, Yeah. everything and anything, whatever works, you never know. So, um, great. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all for now. Anybody have anything else? Yeah. So Linda will have our future topics, uh, if, if she has that handy. I do. It's math and media updates for next month. <laughs> I knew they were the same letter, but I couldn't yeah. remember the letter. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. I should know. Mary Jo. <laughs> Mary yep. Jo. Yeah, Mary Jo and then Debbie Myers. And um, this will probably might be your first opportunity to to work with Stacy Sisler now, who's our new secondary math specialist. And I think you guys will find her to be A plus. Good. Yeah, I, I I saw the name. I can't remember. I don't think we have heard from her yet. So that'll be Actually, one of our uh, one of our vanguards. Who's oh, who, wonderful. yeah, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, she's assistant sorry. principal, and she was also in um, the elite academy um, that Dr. Marco and the leadership team do to develop uh, that kind of administrative leadership. So she is a Frederick County growth story, and I, I think you'll enjoy meeting her. Wonderful. And the Vanguard um, thing is tomorrow, right? At 4.30. Is that right? Yes. All right. Well, very good. Hello, Dr. Marco. How are Hello. you? How's everyone today? Getting better. The rain's starting to go. So. Yeah. I didn't want to inflate Dr. Cuppet's ego, but I recently had a parent approach me and say, said, whoever brought Lexia to Frederick County Public Schools <laughs> is a genius. <laughs> Well, I will tell you that the, the biggest advocate early on is one of our literacy specialists at Sibyllisville Elementary, Kelly Booten, and Debbie Myers, who uses it as a principal. So I was new to it. I went to Sibyllisville, and really, Kelly Booten at that point sold me that we should at least do a field test. And so I'd like to take credit for that, um, but we're going we're gonna to give a shout out to those two folks because they greatly influenced uh, us looking closely at this particular tool. Wonderful. Doctor, I think Kelly, doctor, I'm sorry, Mrs. Yeah. So I I'm like, that's a name from the past. I think when she went from halftime to full time, I got her halftime position uh. in 1993, <laughs> I think. I'd have to, maybe it's a different person, but last name was definitely Booten. Anyway, that's, were you going to say something else, Dr. Marco? I was just going to say that Dr. Cuppet is being humble. He drove this conversation and came to me numerous times and said, it's something we have to have. So kudos to Dr. Cuppet. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you always for your hard work and uh, watching out for the kiddos. And uh, I think we are adjourned. Bye, thank you everybody. <laughs>